Yeah, we're going to start first with a little experiment. So I want you to think just for a second of a wild animal, right? The first one that comes to mind, OK? You got it? That's it. We'll come back later to that. So um, yeah, so the idea of this presentation was to present, uh, firstly, um, what is uh, wild animal suffering in general, and then see what we are doing right now to tackle it. Right? So we have this uh, um, aim now, which is the creation of a new field of research, a new scientific field called welfare biology, to address it. But before that, we need to see what is the reason why we should uh, be worried about that. So what I'll do is I first uh, explain why wild animal suffering is important. Then I'll present uh, some ways in which we are already helping wild animals. And then I'll uh, come back to these reasons uh, to, to create this new field of research. So yeah, wild animal suffering is important. So many people have this idyllic view of nature. They think that nature is kind of like a paradise for animals. Uh, so I mean, it's not that they think that uh, during the evenings they join together and sing songs and all that. But on the average, they think that, yeah, you know, animals are leading good lives there. Unfortunately, this is not really what happens. So there are many reasons why animals have uh, pretty bad lives. Many of them have very bad lives, in fact, um, due to uh, natural causes such as uh, extreme weather conditions, um, hunger and malnutrition, uh, parasites, mm, um, injuries. Like, for instance, this animal um, with an injury such as this one, I mean, that can mean for this animal death. I mean, he or she can't go to a health center and get some you know, antibiotics or, or something, you know? And then disease is also extremely common. Hmm? Many animals die due to horrible diseases that uh, cause them suffering uh, throughout uh, uh, long, long periods of time. You know? So um, we think of them as uh, kind of um, used to that, but that's not the case. I mean, they suffer just as humans would in their, in their case. right? Uh, and on top of this, there are, there are reasons to believe that this is not something that happens just to a tiny minority of, of animals. It's just the other way around. Hmm? Uh, and now I want to come back to this experiment. So I want to ask you, uh, how many of you thought of a mammal when I asked you to think of a wild animal? Wow, a lot of people. How many of you thought of a bird? Just a couple of persons. Reptile? One. Amphibian? One. A fish? One. An invertebrate? OK, the tide is changing. So some people are thinking in invertebrates. <laughs> this is good. This shows that we are making progress on this. Now, the most relevant question now. How many of you thought of uh, juvenile uh, baby animals, very young animals? Only one. So the rest of you basically thought of adult animals. But what happens is that in nature, uh, most animals reproduce by having huge offsprings, right? This happens in the case of mammals. I mean, rodents can have like hundreds of, of offsprings. Um, other animals can have like thousands of, 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 of offsprings during their life. And uh, some may have like millions of them, right? And on average, how many of these animals would you guess survive, make it to maturity? It's very simple. On average, for stable populations, only one animal per parent makes it. What happens to the other animals? Well, they die. Most of them shortly after coming into existence. And the, the thing is that their deaths aren't really nice deaths, you know? They often die due to um, hunger. I mean, many animals never eat. They come into existence, look for food, for food, never find any food, and they just die. Others may be, I don't know, frozen uh, or killed by, you know, as I said, by the cold maybe, um, and others are eating alive. And this happens to the overwhelming majority of animals. Hmm? So this shows that this issue really is serious and really deserves more attention than the ones that has uh, received so far. Hmm? Now, um, what are we doing right now to, to, to tackle this? Well, most of the things that are done uh, deal with uh, very few numbers of animals, or with just one animal. So every now and then, you can see in the media uh, cases of uh, people helping animals. Hmm? 
uh, in distress, like for instance, in, in this case, this uh, phone uh, who was, uh, you know, there uh, trapped in a frozen lake and was rescued, or in some cases there are um, efforts that try to help more animals, like there are centers for, for injured animals or sick animals or orphan animals, such as this baby rhino. Um, there you have more examples of animals uh, treated in centers such as this one, um, getting adequate medical care and so on, you know? So when we see these pictures, we think, well, it's great that uh, we are helping these animals. But after all, when we consider how many animals really uh, are facing these terrible situations, it says that we need uh, to go further than that. So there are some efforts that um, you know, try to help more animals. Uh, so these are animal feeders, as you can see. Uh, they dosify the amount of uh, food that, that animals can get. And these are placed uh, in some cases uh, where you know, certain animal populations are threatened. I don't know, it may be because uh, they are facing a particularly harsh winter or, or something. And uh, you can see this nice picture of these animals going there to feed. Uh, so this is mainly done uh, for conservationist reasons, which are different from caring for, um, for the animals themselves. You know, because you know, they want to keep a certain population uh, there for scientific reasons or because they want tourists to, to see these animals. Um, but that's different from caring for the animals themselves. But still, this helps. And uh, the knowledge we have about how to deal with these situations of hunger could be applied in other cases as well. Hmm? More ambitious uh, uh, um, efforts uh, can be considered too. Uh, as you can see, this is, um, is a picture of a scientific paper which is um, about vaccination against tuberculosis of wild animals. Mm? And there are several other diseases which uh, have been researched too in order to learn how to um, best eradicate certain diseases from certain populations. So uh, again, another, another paper, this um, tackling a swine fever virus. And another one, this is against rabies. And I want you to... Um, Notice the, the, the date of this paper. It's 1988. So this has been uh, some research that has been going on for a while already. It's been decades since uh, scientists started to work on this, and much progress has been done. Um, rabies has been eradicated in many countries, in northern Europe and, and areas, uh, wide areas in North America. Mm? And again, the reason why, why this measure is carried out, it's not because you know, people are concerned about animals, we don't want them to suffer this horrible death. Rather than that, we don't want those animals to pass these diseases to human beings or to the animals human beings live with. But it's still, even if it's not the purpose we are uh, trying to achieve, uh, we are getting somewhere there because we are helping uh, a lot of animals. And uh, even though, as I said, uh, there's been some research on this already. Much more work could be carried out. And uh, just to explain you how this is done, uh, those kind of biscuits or stuff that uh, this uh, person has there, there are some, yeah, as I said, some kind of biscuit with a um, nice smell for the animals and a nice taste. And they introduce the vaccine there. And then they distribute them in the wild. So there are different ways to do this. One is with these dosifiers, so they go there and uh, as I say, they, they just throw one at a time, so it's not that they're gonna get a lot of them. And then, and, and this sounds uh, a bit crazy, but uh, this is actually how this is done. Uh, you see, they go with helicopters, and they have this box there with the vaccines, and with the doses of it, and they just distribute them there like, like candy for the animals, you know? And uh, yeah, so, it's, it's, it's amazing how we can do things that actually can help not just one animals, not just in animals, thousands of animals. And uh, as I said, this is only because we are concerned with humans. So imagine, imagine uh, to what extent we could go in our efforts to help these animals if we were concerned for the animals themselves, okay? So this is where the need for this new field of research uh, uh, comes out. 
So um, there are many costs or several cost efficient uh, causes of action today to address wild animal suffering. And of course, one is to spread the idea that animals in the wild matter, right? Uh, this implies um, first you know, speaking out against the discrimination of animals, against speciesism, spreading concern for animals in general, but then spreading concern for wild animals in particular. Because there are many people who, while concerned about yeah, animal welfare or animal rights, they never thought that uh, animals uh, may need our help because they are suffering due to natural reasons. And uh, yeah, well, some organizations are doing this. Uh, I'm working in animal ethics, and we are distributing materials to educate the general public uh, with a focus especially on people who are involved in academia. And we want to reach also animal advocates to give them information about this so they themselves can go on uh, working and spreading the word about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is uh, another picture of our website. It's in Chinese because it's so cool that we have it, you know, we have our website in eight different languages. I could have put it in English, but, you know, I'm putting it in, Eng in, in Chinese. Yeah? Uh, yeah, why not? But still, I mean, this is only a part of it. So there are more things that are necessary here. So one of them is supporting uh, the interventions that are already being carried out, hmm? such as the ones that I presented before, and then helping to create new ways of helping animals in nature, right? Helping to develop new ways. And it's here where raising interest among uh, life scientists is key, okay? And um, the reason for this is that um, when you consider the work that life sciences carry out that is related to uh, either directly or indirectly to wild animal suffering, what you find out is that there is no um, idea of wild animal suffering as such, or even wild animal welfare that is around. So for instance, when you consider the work of animal welfare scientists, they mainly work with animals that are exploited by humans. In fact, there is a field that is called wild animal welfare. And what they do is they focus on wild animals that are in captivity, or in some cases, uh, in wild animals that, being affect, that are being affected in the wild by humans, uh, by, say, hunting or fishing or, or, or similar activities, right? There is also another field, which is uh, uh, compassionate conservation. And what they focus is in um, trying to uh, achieve conservations in ways that don't harm individual animals, you know? So all these are fields that are related to what we need here, but aren't quite the same thing, right? And then we have the field of ecology. And the field of ecology now has many subfields. You know, ecology works on uh, the study of uh, ecosystemic relations. So there is like uh, community ecology, population ecology, behavior ecology, all of them are fields in it, of ecology. But what we don't have yet is this, welfare biology, huh? or welfare ecology. What is welfare biology? Well, it's been defined as the study of living beings with respect to their positive and negative well-being. But basically, uh, another way of understanding this hmm, is just the study of uh, how animals deal in all kinds of situations, including the wild, right? So although welfare biology would include uh, animal welfare science, as we understand it to get today, it would go further than that, you know, because it would address as well the situations that animals are undergoing in the wild, okay? So uh, this is the new field that we have to create. And it's amazing that in ecology and that in animal welfare science, there is uh, no work on this, right? Because um, clearly, I mean, even if only from a scientific, from an epistemic viewpoint, if we want to know how is the reality of animals or what is the reality of ecosystems out there, the well-being of animals, positive or negative well-being, clearly seems to be something very relevant that should be a part of that. If on top of that, we are not only curious about how things are, but we are also concerned about how those things are for particular individuals, 
then it seems clear that we have most reasons to uh, um, try to develop this new field. So um, there is some work carrying out in this field already. Hmm? And um, yeah, uh, this is a list of, of publications that, that we published. And you can see it's a long list. So you know, I put it there not so you can read them, <laughs> but only for you to look at how long the list is, you know. But um, even if it's a long list, you know, it's not long enough. And in addition to that, you can't read it, but I can explain it to you. Um, a significant part of this uh, literature is by people who are working like in philosophy or ethics or other related fields, but not actual biology. And that's what we need. We need biologists who are involved in this. You know, this is what's necessary now. Actually, I want to stress it in, in red, because this is really something we need, right? And fortunately, there are already some people who are getting involved in this. Um, we are now creating a small network of uh, ecologists and other biologists. Mm? As I said, some animal welfare scientists are starting to be interested in this. Mm? And um, the, you know, yeah, the, um, the prospect of having this new field created is actually uh, feasible now. Some years ago, this could seem like a crazy idea. But now, I mean, it's not going to be immediate. It's going to take a while. But we are on our way there. Mm? What are we doing now? I mean, by, by us, I mean the people who are working in, in this field in general. There are several organizations working on this. Animal ethics is one of them. Then there is wild animal suffering research, uh, utility farms, and, and other groups are working on this too. In particular, in the case of animal ethics, we are now examining, we are carrying research, carrying out research on how a new, uh, new scientific fields have been created in the, in the recent past. We have now interviewed already um, around 15 uh, scientists in different countries mainly biologists, but also animal welfare scientists, to see what ideas they have regarding this, what kind of interventions they think it would be more um, promising to research. I mean, people from different countries, like in the UK, in the US, uh, some around Europe too, in Germany, Switzerland, but also like in Latin America, in Brazil, in Mexico. So we try to cover a, a, a wide range. And we are also working on designing a drafts of what could be research projects, which welfare biologists uh, could be work on, to make easy, as easy as possible, the work of these people who are, who are uh, being interested in this. We are also working in designing how subjects, I mean, subjects that you could uh, um, teach at the university, if you are a, a, a biology scholar, um, could be, uh, so they are focused on animal welfare uh, wild animal welfare, or they include wild animal welfare, welfare biology, among other concerns. So yes, there is uh, much work uh, to be done. But as I said, uh, what's more important to this is getting live scientists involved. So I would have liked to have more time to speak about uh, welfare biology as such and the new developments. But I thought that it would be useful to first uh, tell you a bit about uh, uh, wild animal suffering. Um, but yeah, we'll have time now to discuss, so if you have any, any questions, I mean, uh, we still have like 10 minutes or so to speak. So yes, uh, on behalf of all these animals, again, I want to <laughs> thank you for your interest in this topic. Thanks. Thank you. I, I really appreciated your talk, and obviously so did this audience. Um, unfortunately, we have way more questions than we do have time to answer questions, but you can find him for office hours after this as well. I think at noon, if I'm right, maybe during lunch. I can tell you at the end of the, the talk. Um, so one of the questions um, asked if we should care about animal extinction along the same lines that we care about human extinction, um, and asks if there's a non-speciesist difference between the two cases. Um. Well, actually, if you are concerned about animals themselves, you aren't really concerned as um, you aren't really concerned by um, what happens to the species as such, you know. And um, also in the case of humans, like for instance, suppose that humans were somehow replaced 
by other beings who would be more caring individuals, uh, more intelligent and with, um, you know, better aims that we have, would that be bad? Well, I mean, many people, at least among, you know, effective altruists, would say, well, that would probably be a good thing. So this would be something that uh, would have to do with, uh, somehow with instrumental reasons, but it's all, it also shows that we aren't concerned with species as such. We are co concerned with individuals as such. And the same would happen in the case of, of animals, I would say. Right, great. Um, someone else asked, um, especially regarding uh, the vaccination efforts that you mentioned in your talk. Um, in general, won't wild, animal wild animals just die of something else, even if they are, say, treated for a vaccine? Um, does this pose some problem for the field of wild animal suffering? Yeah, that's a good question. So the thing is, um, well, in fact, there are different ways of, of, of dying. And it's not just uh, the harm of death, you know, because... I mean, there are some people who don't believe in the harm of death. Most people think that when you die, you lose everything, so you can have no more positive in your life, so dying is a harm. But uh, in addition to this, there is the, the harm of suffering. And um, some diseases really are terrible and, and cause uh, terrible amounts of suffering. So if we could avoid that, uh, you know, that would be worth it. Uh, but uh, in addition to this, um, this is a good question because it, it allows us to um, present really what would be the best way to, to address these issues, which would be on a, on, a, um, on a larger scale. So what welfare biologists could do is they could um, research the amount of suffering that different ecosystemic relations create in comparison to others. So for instance, when you consider the conservation of elephants, well, uh, killing elephants may be bad for the elephants, but there is something else to um, take into account there, which is elephants are eaters of huge amounts of biomass. So if they, if, if they aren't there, that biomass is gonna be eaten by these tiny invertebrates who will have lots of offspring, and they will be eaten by these uh, tiny vertebrates, by the invertebrates, but a bit larger, and so on. So we will have very long trophic chains in which there is much suffering. So it's not just about uh, creating particular interventions that reduce suffering. It's about um, studying the, the big picture and taking a look at what is the direction in which we want ecosystems to go for there to be less suffering. Right. Um, our final question. Um, is there a risk that welfare biology will focus almost entirely on mammals and birds? And if so, does that uh, change the cost-benefit analysis of welfare biology generally? Yeah, that's another good question. So I think that um, it will focus definitely on vertebrates at the beginning uh, for several reasons. I mean, not necessarily in the case of, of, of all the uh, research that is, uh, is going to be carried out, but surely the focus is going to be in those animals at first. Uh, but um, that may be like the, the, the foot on the door, you know, the way to get more work in general done and, and to establish uh, the name of welfare biology as something that is respected in academia and that will allow us to then afterwards go on and do research on, on other animals as well. Just as it happens also in the case of animal advocates in general, uh, who mainly work on vertebrates, but who are now starting to consider invertebrates as well. Right, that's great to hear. Well, with that, please join me in thanking him. Thank you. <laughs>